We're about to take a deep dive into Boiler Room 3 on Battleship Texas. Before we start, this video lasts a little over 20 minutes. That may seem a little long, but it really isn't excessive since this is arguably the most complicated room in the entire ship. One thing you'll notice is no time was spent talking about the boilers themselves. The reason for that is you can view a complete description and walk around of one in this channel's video, Battleship Texas Making Steam. You're about to see a room that is in disturbing condition that includes considerable rust and failed paint. It helps to understand why. All three boiler rooms were flooded with a combination of brackish water and fuel oil to a depth of at least 10 feet for 20 or more years. There are a number of reasons for this, but undoubtedly the most important was the lack of millions of dollars required to put the ship into dry dock where the leaks could be resolved. Once this happened in 1988, the rooms were cleaned of residue, damaged asbestos insulation was remediated, and remaining asbestos was encapsulated. Unfortunately, the rooms could not be properly restored because the hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of dollars required to do the work has never been available. However, as ugly as much of it is, what remains is stable and no longer suffers from any significant deterioration. We're going to start out well above the boiler room in a drying room. From there, we'll go to a blower room, then descend a long ladder to the boiler room itself. Okay, let's get going. Okay, we're about to go down to boiler room number three uh, and talk about how things worked in there. But before we do, I really want to start at the top. Above the boiler room, uh, this is called the drying room. And the main features of it is you see this curved piece here. And then there's also one on this side. These are called uptakes. These are basically the exhaust stacks for the uh, two boilers that are located in the room below us. Now, another thing that we'll notice is that, uh, or we'll talk about, is that there are, is a boiler room uh, ahead of us and one aft of us. And the, all the uh, uptakes, the two in each room, come together for a total of six in the drying room that's directly above us. From there, they go into the smokestack and then obviously out of the ship. Well, all those uptakes and uh, the smokestack itself weighs a lot, and that weight has to be supported. And that's what these big cross beams accomplish there. See that? And then these two here. And they actually uh, support the weight that's carried above or down from the uh, smokestack and the, the uptakes that it contains, and all that weight is brought down to a central port point where it's then carried down directly into the ship's uh, lower structure and keel. Now this room, even though they had asbestos blankets covering them and they were well insulated, uh, the, the temperature in this room could easily hit 150 degrees, making it uh, completely unusable except for storage of parts that uh, weren't sensitive to heat. But there was one other function it could serve. The crew would string clotheslines in here. They could bring their wet laundry in, quickly hang it up, come back 10 or 15 minutes later and it would be dry. And that's why they call it a drying room. Now we're going to quickly go down to the next level and show you another extremely important feature. As we came down this uh, short ladder from the drying room, the first thing we see is a blower room. This is a steam-driven Sturdivant brand uh, forced air blower. Uh, each boiler room had two of these, and this was used to pressurize the boiler room, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But the important thing here is that uh, they had to use these to not only provide uh, pressurized air into the boilers, but also it had to be highly variable in order to make sure that they had the correct boiler rate. Now, um, on the back, F, uh, on the uh, bulkhead back there is a pressure gauge that indicated that this typically ran at about 150 psi of steam pressure. Uh, maximum setting on it is 170 pounds. Now, we're about to go through these two doors here and through this little oddly shaped compartment. I'll turn around and we'll look back at it. This is an airlock. Since they had to pressurize the boiler rooms, one of these doors had to stay shut all the time in order to make sure that the room stayed pressurized. So if uh, you were coming down, this door closest to me would be closed. They would open this one, step through, close it behind them, 
Then they would push on this knob here that would allow pressurized air in from the boiler room, equalize the pressure, and once that had happened, then they could open this door, step through, close it behind them. This was how every single person that uh, was entering or leaving the boiler room had to go. Now we're about to descend these, uh, this long ladder here and we'll enter the boiler room. One thing you'll notice about the ladder we're about to descend is that it's fully enclosed with watertight doors at the top and bottom. In fact, there are two of these ladders for each boiler room and they served as protected emergency escapes. Together, they are large enough to give an entire boiler room crew both a means of egress and protection from flooding, fire, or a major steam leak. Okay, we've now descended the ladder and we're about to enter the boiler room. But before we enter, there's two or three things I want to show you here. First of all, you see this uh, small hand wheel on the bulkhead. This is a steam smothering valve. One of the most likely possibilities for problems in the boiler room was a fuel oil fire. It would, uh, fuel oil frequently dripped uh, out from around the fittings on the fuel oil manifold on the front of the boilers, and it would drip down into catch pans that were placed underneath strict, uh, simple, strictly for that problem. But if that caught fire, then from either inside the boiler room or in here, they could open that valve and it would blow live steam down into there and it would smother the fire. Now we also have a couple of other things. First of all, we have this large uh, valve stem protruding down. There was a hand wheel that has been removed. That links up to, let's see if we can see it through that grating. That links up to a huge 14 inch valve that's up there. I'm gonna move a little bit more to this side. There it is right there. And that valve could shut off the entire steam main leaving the room. Also, we have a uh, little red push button box here. That was an emergency uh, cutoff for the fuel oil. The, uh, that uh, operated a, what call, they called a fast acting valve. If they hit the button, it would shut off all fuel oil uh, leave, uh, entering the boiler room. So if they had a catastrophic problem in the boiler room, uh, either a burst steam main or a fire and they were having trouble controlling it, then they could come in here, close the door, and as they were leaving, shut off the fuel oil, shut off the steam main, and open up the, uh, the uh, smothering valve to, to uh, put out any fires down below the boilers. Okay, so here we are in the boiler room and there are four elements uh, that, that are uh, dealt with and controlled in here. Number one, of course, is the steam itself. When steam is produced, they have to control it, they have to route it. Uh, there's a variety of ways of getting it out of the room. And then we also have three other things which all directly contribute to making the steam. The first is fuel oil, of course. We then also have air because we have to combine the air and the fuel for the, to the right ratio to, to create the fires in the boilers. And then lastly, feed water. Well, let's talk about uh, the uh, air first. We just saw that Sturdivant blower, this up here is one of the two outlets into the room. The, this uh, was a forced draft system, meaning that air was basically pushed into the boilers, and to do that, they pressurized this room. Uh, there are natural draft boilers, but they cannot put out nearly the amount of heat, and therefore steam is a forced draft system. Now, they could control the speed of those blowers so that they could raise and lower the air pressure in this room. And that was really necessary because as they wanted to increase steaming rate and they opened up fuel oil valves, the air also had to increase the air pressure to meet the demand. Now, we also have water. And feed water for the boilers was controlled from here. You can see there's a large manifold where there's a whole series of valves and pipes leading into it. The uh, main feed water uh, came from the engine room and uh, it was where it was uh, conditioned properly, uh, removing any dissolved air from it and also preheating it. And it came through these large pipes where it would then go into the boilers. But you can see there's a number of other pipes coming up into it. 
Well, as they condense steam and send it back here, the entire steam loop, there's losses in it. So they have to provide what's called makeup water. The makeup water was added to the system to make up for what was lost. So they could do that by uh, opening and closing whichever valve to pull feed water from tanks that are located directly beneath the boilers. There's also emergency feed water tanks that are located down in the inner bottom of the ship. So if, for instance, they lost their, the condensers that, uh, or the evaporators rather, that made uh, fresh water from seawater, uh, they only had a limited time uh, and to be able to produce steam. So they could also pull in uh, additional water from the emergency feed tanks. Now there are two feed water pumps uh, in the uh, boiler, each boiler room. Uh, one of them is a backup for the other. But just in case uh, you had issues with those, we also have this large simplex pump here. This is a uh, basically a backup feed water pump, and uh, so this is what they would use. Again, you have redundancy. NASA did not invent that term. Now, when they are especially in battle conditions, all of these pumps, you of course would have one made feed water pump that's pumping like crazy, bringing water in. But uh, the other two, the auxiliary pump that's in the uh, engine room, and this one, they would just have it slowly ticking over, just slowly moving. That way, if they needed it, it was instantly available, and they knew that it would work. Uh, but this could add additional pressure to the system. So in order to keep that from happening, these pipes are also set up to where it creates a loop. Uh, unwanted water that comes into the system would re simply be recirculated back to the, uh, to the makeup water tanks. Now we have one other large pump that's just like this one, and it's on the other side of the room. And this is it right here. But this is not for feed water. This is one of the large uh, fire and bilge water pumps that could bring seawater in. Uh, to help fight fires and the water would go to the fire mains. Or if you had serious flooding, then the, basically the operation could be reversed and they could be used to pump water out of compartments and then out through the hull. If you watched uh, my uh, coal to oil conversion, you'll know that uh, there were a total of 92 fuel oil tanks and uh, the vast majority of them were rather tall and they lined the sides of the ship. And in fact, if you look up, you can see where that light and the white overhead is up there. That's basically how high the tanks extend up. And they uh, extended all the way from up there down to about five or six feet below this grate that we're standing on. So these tanks were about 25 feet tall. Now, what this bulkhead that we're seeing here does not directly adjoin a tank. If you had watched that video, you would also know that there was a void, an empty space between the boiler rooms and the uh, fuel oil tanks. And it was there as a safety precaution. If you had a major leak or even a small leak in one of those fuel oil tanks, then it would uh, accumulate in that void rather than come into this room. Now, in order to handle the, the uh, fuel, this was a very com complex system. The first thing that happened is we would go to these two pumps here. These are called uh, feed and recirculating booster pumps. Now, because those tanks were so tall, they actually got a, a, a pretty good amount of natural head pressure that helped push fuel oil into it. But that had to be boosted, and that's what these pumps were for. Now, uh, the, one could serve each boiler. They could either, uh, that are in the room, uh, they could also uh, simply be hooked together. One could go on standby. But regardless, this fuel went into, first went into these two large red tanks that are here. These are fuel oil heaters, and they were heated using live steam uh, to heat the fuel up to about 160 degrees Fahrenheit. This is important because that uh, fuel oil is really thick stuff, and in order to make it really pumpable, they had to heat it up. Now, these pumps are actually kind of a, what they call a rotating piston design um, that wasn't, didn't provide just real smooth pressure, but it could, did provide a lot of suction that could move that thick, syrupy oil. 
Now from these tank heater tanks, the oil went uh, to the service tanks, which are located uh, ahead of uh, boiler room two, which is the farthest uh, uh, boiler room forward, where uh, it would be maintained at that temperature using heating coils. Once it left there, it would go to the service pumps that we will see uh, in just a moment. And, from, and uh, they would either then go to the fuel oil manifolds on the boilers. I'm sorry, let me back up. It would first go to these white cylinders, which are also fuel oil heaters, where it was heated up to over 200 degrees Fahrenheit. And then from there, it would be pumped into the uh, fuel oil manifolds here and then to the burners. Now, this didn't consume all the oil here. In fact, they only consumed perhaps 10% of it. And what was left over was sent back either to the service tanks or it would go back to the fuel oil tank that the original fuel was being drawn off of, off of. And this was a pretty big deal because with that, over a period of time, that fuel oil being recirculated back to that tank would gradually heat that oil up and make it that much easier to pump and control. So we're, now we need to take a look at the service pumps. These service pumps are what are called a screw drive type pump or a worm type pump. These provided extremely good pressure. They could provide up to 35 pounds per square inch pressure. They were also steam, gener uh, steam uh, operated. So here's where the steam came in and I'm sorry, this is the pump. This is where fuel was uh, sucked up from the service tanks and then pumped out to the heaters before going to the manifolds. Once again, it would come out, go to the two fuel oil heaters, and then to the boilers. Now, there might be times when, uh, for instance, if you're a port or if you're just cruising at a, a very low speed, you may want to shut these steam pumps off. And if that's the case, there are also two electrically driven pumps that are called uh, port or cruise uh, uh, service pumps. And these could provide up to 10 gallons per minute of uh, fuel feed and so they could switch over to these pumps and that would allow them to work on machinery here uh, or if they're tied up in port they could pretty much shut the whole system down except for just the small amount needed to keep a couple of boilers warm. We also had uh, one other pump that uh, apparently has been removed from the room and it was a hand pump. Uh, if, every, if the entire system was cold, they could actually come and operate this pump by hand. They did not pump fuel oil, but what they pumped was diesel fuel. They could use that to light off a boiler, start getting it warmed up, and then once they could get oil to a decent operating temperature, then they could switch over to fuel oil. So that uh, so we've covered fuel oil. We've covered um, uh, we've covered. Uh, feed water and we've covered air. Well, that leaves the important thing, which is the end product and that steam. Now, we talked about that some during the uh, boiler room video. I'm sorry, the boiler video. But uh, to kind of hit it, if, let's see here if we can get back and look. You can see there's two large pipes coming off of the uh, what's called the steam drum of the boiler. There's also two coming off of the other boiler that's in this room. They feed directly into the big 14 inch main, but we also have this pipe traveling across the room. That's called an inter a cross connect. And with that, they tied the two boilers together. They tied the two sets of mains. There's a, a main s steam line that runs on the port side and one on the starboard side. By opening that cross connect, they could basically form a loop. Now, if they were in battle conditions, they closed that cross connect and they did that so that they could run the ship systems in two halves. The ports, uh, the ports, uh, boilers, uh, the three that are on the starboard side of the boiler, I'm sorry, on the port side of the boiler room would feed only the steam line on the port side and only feed the port engine. Same thing with the starboard side. This way, if they received battle damage, they could uh, actually shut down one half of the ship and operate everything on the other half. If they had a major, uh, a major problem that uh, took out one of the main steam lines, that way they, at the very least, they always had um, half of their power and half of their engines. And with that, they could cruise up to eight or 10 knots. 
So that allowed them to get out of danger in a fairly uh, reasonable speed. And also they could, um, that would give them time to troubleshoot and fix things. Now the one last thing I want to show you is this red tank here. There were actually two of them here at one time. It was fed by live steam and this is called a foam generator. If you had an oil fire in here, you might be able to extinguish the fire uh, down beneath the boilers in the catch pans with live steam, but if you had a larger fire, uh, you can't put it out with water. So with this, they, uh, they could create foam that, they, that could then smother the fire. They'd have a fire hose hooked up to it, and, um, and then that way they could fight it as they would any normal fire. So this is the complexity of the boiler room. Now, as you can see, there's no way that I could describe all of these pipes here if for no other reason because we simply don't have time. So that is basically a boiler room. Now, one very important aspect of a boiler room is that you had to be able to instantly provide steam uh, for whatever was happening on the ship actually before it happened. If you did not prepare for, for instance, uh, if you're at a low cruising speed and you suddenly wanted to go full throttle to flank speed, you could not o simply open the throttle valves. If you did, your steam pressure in all your systems would, tr would drop tremendously and you'd start losing all the auxiliary pumps, whether it's fuel oil pumps, feed water pumps, even blowers and things. Uh, they'd just simply collapse because they weren't getting enough steam. So before they could even make any large throttle changes, they had to warn the uh, engine room, I'm sorry, the boiler room rather, and you would have a large bell here. Uh, they could uh, then look up and see the engine order telegraph that basically told them for both uh, port and starboard engines uh, what they were going to do. With that, the boiler room would quickly respond by cutting in more burners and significantly increasing boiler rate, and that way the steam would be ready for them when they did make the change. And this could actually just happen in a few seconds, because once the boilers are up to operating temperature, they could change their steaming rate very, very quickly.